Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. I try to forget the mistakes I have made in the past and move forward. But people around me keep reminding me of the mistakes I made. What should I do? Yeah, it's, it's so hard. We try to change. We try to learn, to grow, to evolve. But it's so difficult when the people in the world around us don't want to let us change and grow. When the people in the world around us don't want to let us embody this this newness, embody this change, embody this betterment. And so what do we do then? In that case, what we do is we, first of all, before we can actually change other people's perception of us, we have to change our own perception. That's the first piece. People are only going to accept that we've changed. They're only going to accept that there has been a shift when it's been real. The simple fact that a mistake happened in the past does not mean I've changed. I lied a week ago. Doesn't mean I'm not going to lie today. I cheated two weeks ago. Doesn't mean I'm not going to cheat today. The simple fact that it was in the past doesn't mean I've changed. And so in a way, if you think for a moment about the people who have hurt you in your life, you're only going to really let it go and continue the relationship if you feel they've changed. We're only going to have a shift in our relationships if there's been a shift within us. If somebody hurts you and they lie or they cheat or they abuse or whatever it is that they do, you're only going to move forward with that relationship and let go what they've done in the past if you feel like they've changed. It's very, very, very difficult to trust, to believe, to honor, to have faith if the people around us have not actually changed, if they don't recognize that what they did was a mistake. And similarly, we have to realize that the same goes for us. We do something in the past that we know was a mistake. We want to be free of it. But do we want to be free of it without changing? Or do we want to be free of it because we've changed? And that's an important distinction. And it's a distinction that's only fair for the people around us to know. And so if you find that you've made these mistakes in the past and people are not letting you forgive, forget them, they're not accepting that you've changed... Ask yourself, have I really changed? Am I just trying to put it behind me? Or has there really been an acknowledgement 
that I've changed? Has there really been an acknowledgement that I've taken steps to do something differently? And it doesn't mean we're going to change overnight, obviously. But there needs to at least be a commitment to effort. Because if I've lived with you every single day for the last 30 years, and every day for the last 30 years you've hit me, I'm not necessarily going to wake up tomorrow and believe that you're not going to hit me. Unless you have really taken steps to introspect, to reflect, to understand why you were harming me, and then to really change. And then I will let it go. But if that's how we act, we have to understand that's how other people act. People, our, our ways of interacting with people is habitual. We don't necessarily process every word we say, every action, every reaction. It becomes a habit. And so if you and I used to go out every Friday and get drunk and go dancing, pick up guys and you know, come home only the next morning, And then you change. I'm not going to necessarily know that you've changed or respond to you as a changed being unless that change has been really deep and really profound and has been something that I've been able to see. So if people are not letting us forget our mistakes, just Have patience, number one. Have faith, number two. Have faith, number two, both in them and in yourself, knowing that the truth is a magnet. And when you live the truth, people will respond to that. People respond much more. There's a... In America... You used to hear people say all the time to their children, do as I say, not as I do. Like, I'm sitting over here, you know, smoking cigarettes, getting drunk, but you should never touch these things. Or, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat on my taxes, I'm going to lie to people, but you should always be honest. So you'd frequently hear parents say to their children, do as I say, not as I do. And it's a useless strategy. Because children are going to do what you do, regardless of what you say. And it's not just children. In all of our relationships, we tend to respond to what people do more than what they say. So someone may profess love to us. Oh, I love you so much. You're my one and only. But if we can see from their actions that maybe we're not their one and only, if they're not acting like they love us, the words are going to ring very hollow. And so in our lives, if we're really changing, that needs to come through our actions, not just our words. Doesn't mean we shouldn't say it, we should say it. Sometimes we have to remind people, "Uh, I've changed. Yes, I used to be the person that you got drunk with all night long. No longer that person. Words have to be there, but the actions have to be there even more. Because I can say that until I'm blue in the face. But if they walk in and find me in a bar at 3 o'clock in the morning, my words aren't going to have much value. So when we've made mistakes in our past, whether it was a one-time mistake, whether it was a habitual mistake, whatever we've done, Yes, we have to remind people I've changed. But we also have to embody that change. And if we find that they're really not letting us forget, feel free to say to them, look, the person who committed that mistake is regenerating. 
You know, we always talk about how the cells of our body constantly regenerate. So if I, if I hit you a couple of weeks ago, there's not a cell in my body that hits you. You can't pick up my hand and say, this is the hand that hits you now. That's only going to work if I've really, really repented and really delved into what was it in my mind that made me hit them. Because the cells of my arms have regenerated. The cells of my knuckles have regenerated. They're brand new. But if the patterns in my mind are the same, I'm going to tell this newly regenerated hand to hit you again. And so it only works if I've really, really repented, really changed. And then feel free to say to people, look, I'm a new person. I've really changed. Or I'm working to be a new person. Please, I need your help. I need your support. I mean, if I were an alcoholic, for example, and I I stopped drinking, the last thing I need is everybody reminding me, God, you know, you used to be a really bad alcoholic. So feel free to ask people for help. Feel free to say, look, yeah, I know. But I'm really, really working to be different. And I'd really love your support. And if when I was an alcoholic, I hurt you, I really hope you can forgive me. I know it may not be immediate. I, may not, I know it may not be right now. But I hope that at some point, you'll be able to forgive me. And you'll be able to trust me again. So feel free to ask for that support if they're not letting you, for, you forget it. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. How does one attain moksha or salvation? Salvation refers to being saved. Now, the reason that I've begun here is that in the Hindu tradition, we don't actually believe that you need to be saved. The core of who we are The soul is divine. Now, how do we know it's divine? Because it's been created out of that which is divine. God didn't create us like an artist or like a sculptor. It wasn't that God sat over here on his workbench with his apron and took some you know, clay that was separate and created us. God created us out of God. And what that means is that all of those characteristics and attributes that we think of, of God, 
are actually the qualities and the attributes of who we are at the core in our soul. So we don't talk about being saved. We talk about being liberated. And it may sound very similar, and a lot of times people will sort of interchange liberation and salvation. And it's not a mistake. You were courageous enough to ask this. Lots and lots and lots of people say this. But it actually, in our tradition, we don't, we don't talk about needing to be saved. Because you're not being eaten by a pack of wolves. You're not, you're not burning in hell. And if you are burning in hell, the hell you're burning in is the one that you've created. The hell that we burn in is that which is inside us. When we get angry, right? When we get angry, it burns us inside. We're angry at somebody else, but the fire burns in us, right? Or we feel jealous. We wonder why, you know, other people got something better than we got. Or why they're being treated better than we're being treated. Or so many things. And that burns like a fire inside of us. But that's the only fire of hell that we talk about. So there's nothing to be saved from. What we want is freedom. What liberation means is freedom. And what do we want to be free from? We want to be free from the chains that bind us to our own ignorance. Okay? Now, so we say at the core of who we are is divine, right? So then what about the rest of it? Where'd that come from? Hmm? Okay. So let's take this a different way. You have a soul, or rather you are a soul. You have a body. You are a soul. What else do you have? Hmm. Body parts. What else? I'm sorry? Mind. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And the mind, there's other components. We've got ego, we've got intellect, but we're just, for the sake of this discussion, going to call them all mind. The mind plays a lot of games, doesn't it? Everything is great. It's a beautiful day. You're at the park, you're with your friends, you're having an ice cream. And then suddenly, something comes in your mind, some idea comes in your mind about something your brother or sister did or something a friend did, or you see something, and suddenly your whole day is ruined. Suddenly all the sunshine, all the ice cream, all the niceness, it's still there outside, but we're no longer able to enjoy it because our mind has just played a very nasty trick on us. Our mind has taken us out of the nice park, out of the sunshine, out of that beautiful experience of being together with our friends and family, and our mind has just put us in hell, right? So the mind plays a lot of games. And one of the things that the mind does is it identifies as the body. If I think I'm the I who likes to dance, then who's the I that's watching? Who's the one who says, I like to dance? I mean, who knows that? Because when you're dancing, in order to really like dancing, you can't be liking to dance and dancing at the same time. 
Because where the mind is there, and the mind is saying, I like to dance, the mind creates this separation, right? Now, in order to really like to dance, you have to just become dance, right? If there's still a you who's dancing, it's not nearly as much fun if there's just dance that's happening. If while you were dancing, you were also thinking, you wouldn't be enjoying it so much. And as a quick side note, this is actually one of the dilemmas in many ways of our, our new social media addiction. When you're dancing, you're just dancing. You're not thinking that you like to be dancing. If you were trying to think about dancing while you were dancing, you wouldn't be able to really be there. Then there'd be you and there'd be dancing. But what makes it so beautiful is when there's just dance. The dilemma with our new social media addictions is that we've become so addicted to how we're going to share things and how we're going to post things that we're, we're now sort of living our lives almost a step removed from it because we're literally dancing and taking pictures of ourselves dancing and posting the pictures of ourselves dancing, which means that there's a whole lot more than just dance going on. When it's really beautiful, it's just dance. Okay. So we were talking about who you are. So who you are is the soul. And yeah, sometimes that soul is dance. And sometimes that soul is music. And sometimes that soul is love. And sometimes it is joy. But what the mind does is the mind tries to pull you out of the dance, out of the music, out of the joy, out of the love and say, I like dance. I like music. And the problem with that is that then you actually lose that real experience. And so the mind separates us. We don't have to be saved. Rather, we're looking for liberation, freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the games that the mind plays that make us think we are something other than our soul. And that's what real freedom is. Yes, there is a body. Yes, there is a mind. Because freedom does not say there is no body, there's only a soul. No, there's also a body. There's also a mind. Nothing goes away by denying it. So if we say, well, that anger or that jealousy, or that fear, or this pain is just illusion. Sadly, that doesn't actually make it go away. All that does is continue to keep us more and more separate from it. What really heals all of that is when we know that we are the soul, there is a body, there is a mind, but we're able to look at it knowing it isn't me. So yeah, you have a body. And every day you should thank God for giving you such a beautiful one, such a healthy one, one that can dance, one that can just become dance. Because through this body and through the mind, we actually have the ability, 
with our consciousness to understand that we are the soul and to attain freedom. Freedom doesn't just mean I become brain dead. The way to shut off our mind, the solution is not let me die or let me become brain dead. That's not real freedom. Freedom is to have a body, live in the body, care for the body, have a mind, utilize the mind. As I said the other night, there's a great quotation that the mind is a great servant. It's just not a very good master. So you've got to use your mind. You want to go to school? Do well in school, learn things? You need a mind. But when the mind starts to play its tricks on us, and it starts to tell us that someone is different than us or separate from us, or worse than us in some way, whether it's what they look like, whether it's what they believe, whether it's how much money they have, whatever it is, we're able to understand, ah, that's just just my mind. And then we're able to start watching our mind. And when we're able to start watching the mind, we're able to gain a little bit of control over the mind. And that's ultimately what the goal of it is about. That's why we do our spiritual practice. Puja Swamiji always says, meditation is not what brings God. We don't do sadhana to bring God. We do it to gain enough control of our mind that we can make it quiet enough that we can see God who's already there. It's not that God comes because you meditate or God comes because you pray or God comes because you do your spiritual practice. It's that when we don't meditate or if we don't do our spiritual practice, then our mind is so busy playing its games that we can't see God. And so we do our spiritual practice in order to understand how to use the mind. If sitting here talking to you, as I'm talking to you, if suddenly my hand started going like this, and I just kept giving my lecture, but my hand kept doing this, and, and I said, oh, don't worry, that's just, that's my silly hand. It does that sometimes. Or if as I was talking to you, I started jumping up and down. And I said, oh, don't worry, those are just my silly legs. You'd think that was kind of strange, no? Most of us, if someone doesn't have control over their hands while they're talking, or they don't have control over their legs, we think, what kind of weird person? And especially if they say, oh, don't worry about it. That's just my crazy hand. Yeah, it does that sometimes. It's got kind of a mind of its own. You'd think, she's a little off. But here's what's interesting. Our mind also should be under our control. Just like our arms, just like our legs, we understand that my hand should only do what I want it to do. My legs should only do what I want them to do. And unless I have some sort of disease, I should be able to control my hands and my legs. But then our minds, we let ourselves off so easily. We say, yeah, you know, that's just, that's my mind. Does that all the time. Yeah, I just, I get angry. I have no control over it. I get jealous. I get upset. I have no control over it. I can't be in the present moment. I'm somewhere else. I have no control over it. My hand goes here. I should have control. But my mind goes to Paris. Without my control, we think that's okay? No. No. So this is so this is what why we meditate. Most people think moksha is something we get after we die. 
Most people think of moksha as liberation from the body. But Puja Swamiji reminds us all the time, very, very strongly, moksha is not what happens only after you die. Moksha is what happens while you're living. The chains and the bonds are not the body. It's not the world we live in. Most people think, oh, I just want to be free of this world. I want to be free of this body. Just, God, give me moksha. Like somehow without a body, without this world, everything will be great. But the real moksha is moksha here. Because the thing that binds us is in our own minds. Otherwise, the body is a really nice thing to have. The body is what makes us be able to enjoy the sunny day at the park, the ice cream, getting a hug. Right? If we didn't have a body, if we didn't have a brain that had sensors that said, oh, that's a good hug, we wouldn't know. So the body actually and the mind don't have to be the source of trouble. They can actually be the source of joy. The problem comes when we are bound to them, chained to them. And it's from that that we want freedom. So freedom from the chains that my own mind puts on me. The chains that my own mind that says... This is, this is just who I am. I'm this color. I'm this religion. I'm this body. Because then, if I am this body, and I am this mind, then I am all of my limitations. I'm all of my fears. I'm all of my emotions. I'm all of the tests that I failed. I'm all of the mistakes I made. I'm all of the times I fell down. Then that's all part of who I am. But it isn't. That's part of the body and the mind. Who you are is the soul. And if you know that, then you can have a body, use your body, have a mind, use your mind for great joy, for even more freedom, for even more consciousness, for even more awakening, and to bring joy to other people. If you don't have a hand, how can you give a hand to somebody else? If you don't have a face, how can you smile at somebody? And that smile that you can bring someone, that hand that you can give someone, can bring them freedom, can help them break free, can help them have moksha. So moksha doesn't have to be what happens when we die. Moksha can happen right here when we realize, I'm not the doer. The problems happen when we think, I am the doer. I'm the one who does everything. I'm the one with all the responsibilities. I'm the smart one. I'm the capable one. If I wasn't there, nobody would have gotten this taken care of, right? It's all me. So that's where the problems start. But if we realize, okay, God is the doer. I'm just the, the vehicle. Like, is this microphone giving a lecture? Who's giving the lecture? For the microphone to think that it was giving a lecture would be crazy. I'm speaking through the microphone. It's just a tool for my voice. But in the same way, just on a slightly deeper level, it also would be crazy for me to think I'm giving the lecture. Because just like I'm holding the microphone and speaking into it as a tool, so God is holding me and speaking into me. 
whatever we do, we're being used as tools. So if we realize that, that I'm not the doer, the doer is God, I'm just the the tool in God's hands. And so then, then our prayers to God become, oh God, use me as a tool in your hands. Let me be a tool for love. Let me be a tool for healing. Let me be a tool for goodness. Let me be a tool for peace. Then that becomes our prayer. Not, oh God, make me, make me the prettiest girl in the class. <laughs> or, oh God, make me, I should, I should get the highest grade in the class. Now, if you studied the hardest and you happen to be the smartest and you did very well, by all means, you should have the highest grade in the class. But you should recognize that that also is just a tool for you to have knowledge so that you can be an even bigger tool. This tool, the mic, is very important. Like our bodies, our minds as tools, very important. This is why we take care of them. If I take this microphone out in the rain and I let it get full of water, it's not going to work very well. If I stick it in a mud puddle, it won't work very well. If I flush it down the toilet, it won't work very well. We have to take care of it. But that's still not enough because as beautiful and wonderful as the microphone is, if it's not connected to the plug in the wall from where the power comes, it's still not going to be very useful. If we're not connected to that, that source, if we're not connected to God, then it doesn't matter how beautiful our tool is. So the real moksha, the real freedom comes when we remember all the time, okay, God, I am the soul. I have this body. I have this mind. And let my body and my mind be a tool in your hands. And let me always remember to stay plugged in. So that your will and your power can always flow through me. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul, every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Our, our dharma talks about love and peace and compassion and kindness and generosity. But Bhagwan Krishna plays a very key role in the war of the Mahabharat. Bhagwan Ram fought and won a war. How do we reconcile those? So... 
love, compassion, caring. These are virtues. This is dharma. Nonviolence. This is dharma. And then we have these, these stories from the epics, from the scriptures of great wars. How do we reconcile it? Well, the only way to reconcile it is to understand it in a much broader context. It's to understand it in a, in a context in which we're choosing, choosing righteousness over unrighteousness, choosing dharma over adharma. It's a best case of a bad case scenario choice. Antibiotics kill bacteria. If you've got a bacterial infection, you've got pneumonia in your lungs, well, what is pneumonia? It's a type of bacteria. And it's growing and growing and growing and growing in your lungs. They multiply and divide like crazy. Soon you can't breathe. Then you're on a ventilator. So even those of us who are hardcore naturalists, there comes a time where you say, okay, fine. My life is at stake. Very few people are such hardcore naturalists or such hardcore nonviolent people that they would refuse to take an antibiotic to kill pneumonia and instead would let the pneumonia kill themselves. Most of us understand that my life is of more value. And yeah, we're making a value judgment. But it's a judgment that most of us share, that my life is of more value than the lives of the bacteria. They're also alive. But my life is of more value than theirs, so I'm going to take an antibiotic and kill them so that I can live. Even those of us who are very, very, very strict vegetarians, one of the things that comes up so frequently is usually young kids will say to me, well, so if you were stranded in the jungle, you were, you were lost in the forest, you had nothing to eat, there were no berries anywhere, you were going to die of starvation, would you eat an animal then? And I always say, yeah, I hope I could. I mean, I obviously hope I'm never in that situation. I couldn't guarantee that I could actually muster what it takes to kill an animal and eat it, but I would hope that I could. And I certainly would have no moral problem with it because even though I am a very staunch, very hardcore vegetarian, I also am able to make a value judgment that says, in my view, my life is of more value than the life of the squirrel or the chipmunk or whatever it would be that I would find and, and kill to survive until I was rescued. But that is only the case if I am going to commit my life to good work. That's not an... an uh, an absolute truth. I do not believe that in an absolute sense, a human life is of more value than an animal life. But if we are committing ourselves to dharma, to good work, then yeah, I could morally justify killing a small animal to save me so that I could be rescued and go out and do good work. And this brings us to the issues of the Mahabharata War, the War of the Ramayan. Nobody wanted to kill Duryodhana and his army. They did everything they could to prevent the war. The whole story of the Mahabharata is full, not just of the war. It's full of all of that which led up to the war. And I won't go into it tonight, but just all of the times that they tried 
Even Krishna himself tried to prevent this war. Just like the naturalists amongst us take everything we can, you know, we eat as much lemon and honey and ginger and all, you know, hot beverages and tulsi and all this stuff that we take to fight off those bacteria. We don't, we, we don't go to antibiotics as our, our first stop. It's only when it doesn't work. And this is what happened. Same thing in the Ramayana. Lord Ram didn't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, you know, there's this, this Ravan, and I've heard of him, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit myself to killing him. Even after his wife was abducted, he sends Hanumanji as an emissary. Only when nothing works do they go to war. And these are wars of dharma against a dharma, of righteousness against unrighteousness. And what they knew in both cases was if they don't fight this war, if the quote-unquote bad guys of both of these stories are not vanquished, they're going to keep killing more people. Like if I don't take the antibiotic, the bacteria is just going to keep growing and growing and growing and eventually take my life. And that's what was happening in both cases. And so they didn't fight the war because violence is a good thing. They didn't fight the war because they forgot that compassion and love and nonviolence are our dharma. They fought the war to restore dharma. Where a dharma, where unrighteousness had taken over. And tragically, sometimes people have to be killed. Another Close to home example would be, you think about it, if you were walking down the street with your mother, with anyone, or even even just alone, and suddenly somebody comes and starts attempting to kidnap or to kill or to rape your mom who you're walking with, or just a woman on the road, a young girl on the road. Well, very few of us would keep on walking. We might all start by saying, hey, hey, stop. We might call the police. But if things escalated and our hey, hey, stop didn't work and the police still didn't show up and the violence was getting worse or he was on the verge of getting her into his car, we might reach down if we had a, you know, an umbrella in our hands or a cane in our hand and hit him. And if a light hit didn't work, we might hit him harder. Not because we're violent people, not because we forget that love and compassion are virtues, but because in that moment we are acutely aware of the fact of there being a higher good in this of violence being absolutely required as a last resort to restore dharma, to restore righteousness. Very few of us are prepared to sacrifice our mother or a woman on the street or a young girl on the street into the hands of a a rapist or a murderer or a kidnapper just because we don't believe in violence. Most of us would muster up whatever it took to use our strength to get this guy to stop. And that's, that's what happened in the war of the Mahabharata and the war of the Ramayana. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, 
They aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. The purpose of life and we're going to weave rituals into this. The purpose of life is actually to wake up and to know who you are and to connect with yourself as divine and the divine. You can do that in any career. I always say we didn't come onto this earth with a stamp on our behind that says, you know, Librarian, football player, CEO of billion dollar company. We came onto this earth with divine stamped on us. So in terms of your career, there's no, there's no formula. What's important to ask yourself is, first of all, I have been given this birth for God's will to flow through me. How can I use my abilities, my skills for that? So what can I do that allows me to be of service to the world? And I don't mean that you have to go out and form an NGO and collect billions of dollars and you know feed every child who's hungry. There's lots and lots and lots of ways to be of service. But I can tell you that that's the most fulfilling way. But remember that your purpose is to awaken to who you are, to connect with that divine, and then to allow that to flow through you for the world. And this brings us to the rituals because that is the point of rituals. The point of rituals is not that God is somehow happy with our rice or our ghee or our flowers. He created them. And they're his, hers. God doesn't need us to offer them back. And it's not that there's some great, you know, preference over the the grain of, of rice over a grain of amaranth or a grain of barley. The rituals are for us to connect. The rituals are for us to step out of our other life and other duties and to actually make some time. When you love someone and you go home with a flower, it's a ritual. You bring chocolates on your anniversary, it's a ritual. But it only works if there's love behind it. If someone has done something really awful to you and then they send you some chocolates and you know that it's only so that you're not really mad at them, it's not going to have that kind of an impact on you because you know this guy or this lady is just trying to buy me. But if someone who really loves you makes you something, if your child cooks you something, homemade chocolates, and they're horrible, you're going to love them anyway because they were made with love and from love. 
And so with rituals, it's not about the intricacy of them. It's about the love behind them and the connection behind them. So do that which you can do with love and with connection. And that's the main point. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time on Ohm Times Radio. Thank you.